schools made the pieces and I just kind of threw it out there and I said I know you're gonna do a great job and I, and I showed them the different techniques and they made these beautiful pieces and so they um let's see go this way so this was the so that was um that was the beginning sort of of the jeans let's see and then uh, what happened was I took uh, I took my jeans home and I laid them out on my couch I didn't want to just, I didn't want to like hurt them when I, when I packed them away. So as I put them on my couch, I'm like, wow, look at that. It looks so, it's so sculptural. It's sculptural and it, it's uh, so much more interesting when you see these elements sitting on volume more than just against the wall. You know, they really need to be, to have shapes. Um, so let's just see here. I have to do that one. Oh, and so as I started to study, I also, um, they remind, actually those, are, they reminded me of muscle shells. And um, this is a project I'm working on about climate change and how our, our waters are becoming more acid. And in, in, in Maine, we are having trouble with the mussels. There's some of the mussel species are in danger in some of the, in some of the I do these sh other shell sculptures. And so it made, so then I started studying like, okay, what's the relationship between genes and mussels? And um, so the, these remind me of mussels. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah, that's a sculpture I'd done years ago with mussel shells. Um, oh, wow. But anyway, to, to make one pair of jeans, it takes around 1,800 gallons of water, just for one pair of jeans. So it's really hard on the environment. Um, so I'm like, huh. So this is one of my shell sculptures. Wow. Your patient. Huh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so when I, do, when I do this kind of work, like when I question the environment and, I, and like people wonder like, what is, like, what is that material? And, like some people will look at this and they'll say, is that, is that something that's real? Where did you find that? And it just sort of sparks conversations about nature and how, how we can make, I mean, small differences at least. Um, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is what, this is the installation called the Pandemic Clock. And this is, and this is what I did at the Speedball Gallery. And the way my work works is that it is really nothing without the visitors. The visitors bring my work to life. And so what I do is I build objects. Like I had these shoes, I actually had a telephone, I made a guitar, um, this house, and I actually had, there was a bigger house. Um, so I had three houses and, um, and I put the, and I had my skirt that people could wear if they fit into it and my jacket. And then I, and then I had this stand and then I had music. And when people come into the space, they're a little shy at first and then I'm like, you know, you're welcome to wear anything, you know, you can interact with this, you know, and this is a pandemic, so people, you know, are a little off. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah. let me just show you. So this is a one minute clip just showing you. So I could only invite a few people and it was over a 10 day period. And so this is just a little collage of like how people interact with my piece. Let me make sure my computer is connected to this. Hold on. Um, to my Wonder Room. Connect. Boop, boop. Oh no, it's not to go from here. Hold on, stop there. Since I started sorry, sorry. I'm going from this computer. Hmm. Complicated. Make it, how do I make this bigger on your screen? These are just random visitors that came. Thank you. 
teaching artist, so I'll go into a, into a community and I'll work with them to create a project, like we created this project um, with the community. And so I proposed something with the Maine Arts Commission and the, the Department of Education to create a virtual teaching art, artist program because there's so many schools that are far away and most artists don't live in those areas, so they really don't have access to working with a real artist. And, um, and so we said, well, gosh, the pandemic is like the perfect time to try this. Uh, so we did like, I had to create, I created an online studio visit and then I created all this programming about uh, jeans, denim, and then I sent little packages in the mail like with art kits that was all labeled with different projects. And I worked with um, the Passamaquoddy School up at Pleasant Point, which was fascinating, and all winter, and then with the Miranda Cook School with this piece. Um, and so I'm, and I wanted to show them a film about what the indigo plant was, I wanted to get, and I wanted to, but, and then uh, about some of the other artists that work with indigo and denim, but I didn't want to bore them with something that was like too educational or anything. I wanted them to have fun. So um, I did a whole, a whole presentation and then I changed it. I'm like, this is really boring. So this is kind of crazy. This is, um, it's four minutes, but it's through dance. It's like I say, and everything that you see in here, like the gene, the, all the jean dances were were sponsored by like Levi's or big uh, big jean companies. A lot of the sculptures were commissioned by jean companies. So you're gonna get a little uh, a little taste. It's kind of wild. Okay, so now we're gonna have to play this way. All right, now hold. Let me make sure it's connected to my speaker, not yours. <laughs>
pandemic, because I really had to learn how to become a filmmaker, because everything was filmmaking, all your teaching. I mean, that was it, because the children, uh, even the adults couldn't understand the tutorials if you just showed them, because it was too slow. So you had to make it kind of fun. Yeah, so oh, back to awesome. the slideshow. India, and that's why it's called Indigo. In Greek, it means um, um, where, in, where it's from, so from India. And uh, I just focus on Japanese uh, indigo because I was really interested in the samurais and um, a lot of and the Boro fabrics that you're going to see. I was just so fascinated by that. And there's still like five farmers that are growing indigo, organic indigo plants and doing that the old fashioned way, whereas most of genes are now synthetic. Um, but genes were not invented by Levi Strauss. I just wanted to say that quickly and then we're going to move on. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Hold on. Okay, so um, this is, I just discovered so much. What I discovered online is there's a real debate about where jeans or denim, where it, was, where it began. And the town of Nîmes in the south of France, that's where I used to live like 45 minutes away from there, they claim that it's from Nîmes and Genoa claims it's from Genoa. And then, um, and then I discovered like some like very intellectual research papers about you know this subject, and they said, well, there are these mid you know these medieval paintings that were found in these churches, and this is like a canvas moleskin that was painted with white paint, and um, they were where are they now? They are in they're in Genoa right now. Um, so jeans have been this material has been around, um, and then it gets better because then they found there's this. Uh, is this painter, and they call me an, the anonymous master of blue jeans. No one knows who he is. He's from the Lombardy region, and he is. And it's they're sort of rare paintings because this was in the like 60, mid 1600s. But back then, the paintings were mostly commissioned by wealthy people, so they mostly the subject matter they probably wouldn't have been peasants. So this is really unusual that this painter was depicting peasants and that many of them were wearing jeans or were head or repairing jeans um, denim. So that the material material had been in the Lombardy region. So that's sort of interesting. Um, here we go, the, the, the debate. And actually there there this year, I don't know because of the pandemic, it may have been slowed down, but um, Genoa is opening a museum of jeans. That's something <laughs> and they do these I mean they do these salons where they invite like a certain number of artists to come. Um, and they're given a certain size panel and they do these creations about jeans. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so you can see in some of these old pictures of Genoa that even some of the sails were blue. You know, so they also used, and that was, what did they say? That was back, yeah, they said they claim the Italians started making denim in the 1500s and that the uniforms for the Navy were in denim and this blue, blue indigo dyed fabric and the dock workers, because it was super sturdy. And, um, but then the French, so anyway, and jeans, like if you think about it, the word in French for Genoa is gen, and bleu is bleu, so it would be les bleus de gen, so blue jeans. Right. So that's where that blue jean comes from. But Nîmes made a very similar fabric, and their fabric is serge, I don't know how to say that in English, serge. serge. Did you say serge? serge? And so they started fabricating pretty much the same time, and so they say it's serge de Nîmes, Denim from Nîmes, so denim. So they claim it too, and they're starting to the <laughs> today. Yeah, and they actually try to claim it. And there are people, there are young people in the city that have opened up, um, like they're recreating this fabric the old-fashioned way, and they're trying to like make a big deal out of it. Um, but anyway, so then let's go on. So then the samurai that fascinated me. So um, the, this fabric, the indigo properties. Um, First of all, it would, they would wear it under their armor because it has it has like an antibacterial quality, and it would if they hurt themselves, it would help their wounds, and it apparently repels mosquitoes. It it, uh, it helps the odor, like the, you know you don't smell as badly when you wear that. Um, helps with snake bites. What else could it? Oh, and even it even has um, the fight the firefighters would wear it as well because it has anti um, how do you say that anti-inflammatory quality, even though you would say flame retardant qualities, yeah. So anyway, so that was in the 1600s. Uh, there's just so beautiful. Last so last samurai. Um, and then this, I just want to say this is in India, really, that's where it started. 
in 5,000 years ago, whew, in sort of Pakistan area. So anyway, that's where that happened. Oh, and this is just that Napoleon also thought that indigo fabric was fabulous. And I lived in France and the French uniforms today still are so beautiful. Like they really are like the post people, everyone that has a government job looks so handsome in their uniforms. So Napoleon also wanted this indigo for his uniforms. Um, so his uniforms have indigo dyed fabric, the same fabric. Oh, and this is what I really, I became so passionate about this. And this is the beginning of my Boro, whoops, of my Boro jacket. I'm just gonna continue to cover. So this is, um, it, Boro, Boro means like something like, like tattered or repaired. And um, during the Edo period, which is like the 1600s to the 1868, sort of around there, these, these or the, the peasant people, the lower class people were allowed to wear like cotton and sort of natural materials and they had and they were allowed to wear indigo whereas the emperor would say well the, on the upper class they're allowed to wear silks and bright colors and bright in large patterns but the poor people had to wear this sort of these basic indigo um, dyed clothing and they often didn't have a lot of money to to buy new clothing so they would just keep mending and mending and mending and over the generations they they sometimes they'd hand these garments down and they became quite heavy so they also served as like for warmth and also protected them in the fields same sort of thing and I, they're just so beautiful let me just let me see i think it's better to show you there's another one And it's this, it's this hand stitching they do. I did hand stitch, but I will hand stitch on top of this afterwards. And this is like someone contemporary who, who's starting to do it. That's for the children I put that which is, oh, which is contemporary. <laughs> and this is, um, this is a contemporary borough and there's a company called Capital and um, they're making these contemporary borough clothing and it, they're like, that shirt's like $2,500. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And there's some more from this company. There's that one, 2100 for that one. Wow. <laughs> more contemporary. And that's just my jacket that I'm working on. Yeah. Oh, and then I showed my son. So this is, because I, you know, it's so funny Instagram, because people will, from all over the world, write to you, and there's a whole world of denim out there. And so the denim artists have like latched onto me, and they comment everything I write, and like, oh, mending, because this is my son, and he turned, and so it was for his birthday was in February and I just finished it because I'm always late <laughs> but he helped me design this and I'm, for the rest of his life I'll patch that shirt for him and and if he ever you know has a partner or children I'll make them Boro shirts too and then this artist wrote to me mending is an act of love Aww. and that's so nice it is though you know so I think that's <clears throat> And then we do come to Levi Strauss. Um, so actually Jacob Smith, was a t he was a tailor and he invented the rivets. And because they were the miners and the cowboys, their pants were always ripping. And, but the cowboys were pretty upset because the rivets would rip and tear the, they would mark the saddles, the leather, they would hurt that. So they, he had to discontinue the rivets in the back of the pants. Uh, but he couldn't afford to patent the idea. So he came to see, uh, he went to see Mr. Strauss and they teamed up together and that's, um, that's how Levi Strauss happened, all of that. Is that Levi Strauss? That's, yeah, so this is Jacob Davis, this is Levi Strauss. And then this is just some of the miners wearing the jeans. And so the, den the fabric, the canvas that denim is dyed into, um, it, has that always been sort of, if we're gonna use indigo, we're gonna use that fabric? Well, I think the rigid, they wanted that rigid fabric yep. because of the sturdiness of it. I mean, these, this was solely, it seems like a, it was mostly utilitarian, that, you know, and, and they use like, there's a, a nice Arab cotton or they could even hemp, you know, they, but they find the strongest canvas yep. and then they would dye indigo because they had those qualities to, to against when they hurt themselves and holding up, um, holding up over time. Um, and then, and it's pretty interesting because the miners, we have some also, so one more And then I discovered, <laughs> I was looking online for the most expensive pair of jeans, and there's actually a thing, mining for jeans. And people will go into, because there are a lot of these old mines, and they'll go into the mines, 
because when the miners would, um, when, when their jeans would wear out, they would tear them up and they'd wrap them around pipes. They used them for insulation, they used them for a lot of things, but you could find old pair of jeans. They'd just discard them in the mines. And like this pair, what did I say? Who was the Levi's will buy those for their archives. Like this pair was like $100,000. Oh. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> and then and then we move into like where it shifts into fashion sort of and and uh, and rebellion uh, with Marilyn Monroe and Misfits and then of course James Dean and that's when they had started to even out like band jeans at schools and certain places you know but it, mm -hmm. that's it. And then I thought this is these are some more contemporary jeans that they're really <laughs> interesting. <laughs> right. Some more jeans. And this this pair of jeans is two hundred fifty thousand dollars because they uh, it's a company called Dusalt Apparel Trash Jeans, <laughs> but they put actual gems into the jeans like rubies and different things. So <laughs> kind of wow. wild. <laughs> Oh, now we're into now we're into the artist. So this is um, he's probably the most well-known jean artist, and he has a warehouse. And he's in the warehouse now, so he'll go to his warehouse and, and he'll spend sometimes seven hours looking for the right value of denim for his pieces. And he works um, flat, like we saw a lot of his pictures in the film. I think we're going to see another one here. Yeah, what's that? Stitched or glued? Huh? Stitched or glued? They're all glued. Yeah, and you can see like he used like he used the bu belt buckles here and different parts mm -hmm. of the jeans, you know. So. And then he was, I think, I think I have a picture of this. Yeah, so then he was commissioned by a jean company in San Francisco, and this is totally outside his comfort zone, because he doesn't work this way. And they said, we want you to design us, just draw us some flowers, and then we have these machines, and we can laser cut the flowers, and we want, we'd like you to do an installation at the San Francisco flower market. So he had never done anything like that, and this is, I think it's just stunning what he made. So um, just another way of, of him using jeans. That's just, I don't know who that artist is, um, but I like the way they use the, the whole material. And this is another sort of well-known um, artist that works with Indigo, and he, uh, he and his wife, Roland Ricketts, and they've actually raised Indigo themselves. And he's done a lot, so that actually is the Indigo plant. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> like in raising Indigo, sometimes to really get the color, I mean, it could take a year to really to make the pigment and have it ready to, to use for dye because there's so much like drying, you know, drying of the plant, and you have to keep airing it out, and then then it's that whole composting, and then they have to keep turning it. It's really such a process, and then to get the right color, you don't just like you dip it in the dye. It doesn't come out that rich blue. You, sometimes 50 times you have to dye it in. So that's why they're really very blue hands. Um, but Roland Ricketts again. That's Roland Ricketts also. His wife is Japanese. So that was him. And this was, I don't know when he did that, but he sent these little pieces of fabric, indigo dyed fabric, to people all over the world and they had to live with them for like six months. Carry them around with them all the time and then send them back in the mail. And then he did this and he ironed them all out and he did this whole installation. And it's floaty. It's really very beautiful. This is a Turkish artist. Um, her name is, De as I said, I pronounce it, De Denise. And uh, I, like, I like her materiality and how she uses the denim. And this is Jim Hodges, um, and he works with a whole team. He works flat, and, he, and these are all, um, it's like a serger that he works with, if you look there. Wow. Yeah. And this is one of the pieces that was uh, an architect that was uh, commissioned to do this for me. I loved, I loved this piece. This is called Africa Blessing, and Abubakar um, Fofana is from West Mali, from Mali, and he um, he's, he does all these workshops on indigo. If you look him up online, you can go and do a workshop with him, and he seems so lovely. And he, this project, he took 54 sheep and goats, and he dipped them in organic indigo dye, and it represented the 54 different countries in, in, his, in Africa, and he let them travel, he just let them go, and it was all about how 
we all carry our culture with us. We have our beauty inside, no matter where we're displaced. You know, if we go to a, a new country or like the refugees that live in Portland, you really bring your beauty with you. It's, it's inside, it's part of you. But he got in a lot of trouble because the animal activists thought it was like cruelty to animals, whereas he was really protecting the animals because it was like protecting them against snake bites and bugs and everything. But um, yeah, I think I have, do you have any more pictures of that? I just love those. No, that's also his work too. Uh, that's there's a museum in India, um, the Arvin Museum, which is their textile manufacturer, G. And so this is also um, Abubakar Fofana's piece there. It's just another artist. For those coming to the workshop, they can get ideas. This is the collage. Power Levi's, again, Levi's commission. Oh, and this is that splash wall. I just, it was um, some of in, in, it was in Avignon. There's a festival every summer in Avignon, and they were commissioned. This was part of that festival, and they did. A, they were asked to, to to choreograph a piece about indigo, and so this was the piece. And it really does look like the fabric. If you saw it in the movie, how the fabric was running in the water. I mean, this, and this is this is like a real place you can go in Houston. I, I afterwards I was looking it up. I'm like, why would I go there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, so this is Marking Lives Project. So the school project that I did, um, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to have to reconnect again. Um, so um, this is what I showed my students, because I was going to do a piece. So I think it's going to work. I'll try. I'll try to get that to This is very short, 21 seconds. No, it doesn't want to get big. pieces and I'll show you what I did with them and then oh, back to here let's see what I did right. so here's what I did with them like the last last I think it's this one oh that was just that's the piece that I made I thought I had the uh, film that I showed piece. stacking maybe I did let's see that shows the stacks that I made the thousand stacks let me just see oh. if I have the oh here it is maybe it's not Nope, it's not. Oh well, you try one more time. Oh well, we'll just skip it. Anyway, and this piece was done, which is over here by the uh, middle school in Moranacook, and they because they love the dots. Because the second film that I did that didn't come up is me piling them up just like really fast, and they're like, oh, we want to do that too. But they did much more interesting piles than I did. I love this piece, and so my friend now the show's going to happen at the Barker Gallery in MIT and Harvard, and so the pieces are going there. So the kids are like. I have to frame it, and you know, I, it's a big deal. And it's a thousand pieces of fabric. Yeah, so there, so the kids when they did it, they had to count the pieces as, and they had to mark it on the back like ten pieces. Some of them were lazy. Some of them did like fifty pieces, you know. But we couldn't put them all on because we could only have a thousand pieces on this board. Right. So hopefully, no one's going to count too carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> so there it is. That's cool. Uh, and these were um, also part of the project. So. So this was a pandemic project I was doing with the kids, and so these are emojis about how the, how we felt about the pandemic. Oh, that's cool. I think that's true. Yeah. Oh, so these were mine. These are my examples. And I'll show you what the kids did. And these were the kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they were. It was really interesting. You know, really to hear the kids. And then they had. They have to. I mean, we have another poetry section, and they did. They did some type. Like it's pretty depressing. Like we did. The, I think I have to be able to show you. But like they say lonely and annoyed and um, uh, one, of, one of them says cripplingly, cripplingly depressed or I mean they're so sad you know I was like oh my gosh these kids let's see so this is what we made um, it's for their school and so these are all individual like denim pieces they tired boring <laughs> and we just the stacks are in here too everything's mixed in the mo emojis the different works of art and that's like, it's big, it's like 12 feet by eight, wow. you know, big panels. And that will go in your school. Wow. So, let's see. Um, oh yeah, no, this is just the grand finale here. This is really fun. Let's see if I can get this to work. Let's see if I can get this to work. Full screen, there we go. Let's see if I can. Oh, it's full. He's making 
making music with a thousand genes. Play that because it'll be here shortly. Should I just the bad part is like the fabrication of the genes. Because what happens just like watering the cotton is already like so much water. I mean like twelve hundred gallons probably just to water the cotton. And then they have to like when they do these these, they now people like these jeans that are distressed, so they have to wash them so many times, mm -hmm. and they go through this whole process, and then they'll take stones and they'll wash them with stones, and then they and then they'll add acid to that, and then they, where does that water go afterwards? And so um, Levi's has this whole, they have a whole campaign where they're showing how they're being kinder to, to the planet, but I don't know, it's pretty, um, and the same with the synthetic, the synthetic dye's not good. The indigo is fine, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah, but. I'm sorry I can't show you this. This, this is this, this wonderful man stay, sitting on top of a giant pile of jeans and he makes like music oh. with all these different elements. I guess we can see it on my computer, couldn't we? Just for my computer. Let's see if it comes up in mine. This doesn't want to work. Let's see. That's funny, it just wanted to hit the very end, it stopped. Right, my goodness it was.